Hello, everyone. This is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now, this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the AFR podcast. Today, I'm joined by Captain Joe Lopez. Joe, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited because we're going to get into some, uh, some firefighting talking. Mostly, this has been uh, medical so far. Yeah, I'm excited to do this. Um, this is a topic I think uh, a lot of people have questions about. Hopefully, we can get some good information out there. Awesome. All right. Well, real quick, uh, if if people don't know you out there, what's your background? How long you been in the department? Uh, where you been? What units? I've uh, been uh, with Albuquerque Fire Rescue now for 15 years. We just passed 15 in June. Um, probably about 95% of my career, I've been right here at the uh, doghouse, fire station five, um, every rank so far. Um, which has uh, given me some great experience. Um, I did four days in the alarm room, which was the shortest uh, shortest uh, stint ever, I think, in the alarm room. In the history? In the history of AFD. Um, so not much support uh, experience. Um, and then were you on the ladder as a pipeman, as a driver? I was a pipeman here. Was the first Station 5 was the first bid I ever bid to. As a firefighter, um, I piped here for a few years, drove here for a while, um, came back as a lieutenant, promoted lieutenant in 2010. And were you guys switching when you were piping and driving? Were you guys switching off trucks or were you just on one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm a firm believer that we should be working on all the different trucks. And when we have multiples like this, it's something we've been uh, doing our whole career. Um, And it's benefited me in the long run. Nice. All right, so you're a field guy. Uh, something we also have in common is we're both uh, Browns fans. All right, and I think we can tie that uh, common thread into uh, the fire department somehow. So listen to this real close. So as Browns fans, we're both used to uh, taking a bunch of losses every year, right? But you got to you got to bounce back, and uh, this is their year. So do you have any uh, examples of maybe having a bad experience, but using that to learn from? like a lesson learned sure this, this job is this job is a lot of times um, you're not going to do everything right every single time that's one of the reasons i'd like to do so much training is um, i like to see stuff before i actually have to do it in an emergency and i can think of one time when the whole station was out other than i was a uh, new engine uh, engine lieutenant and and the captain asked me to switch and we had a fire right across the street and it was just us and the chief Um, we did our thing we did a quick search still no one on scene Um, when a pumper finally showed up we went to the roof and we were afraid that it was spreading through this uh, this fourplex so we went up to the roof to cut a hole and I'm thinking we're set we made a great cut turns out it was in the wrong spot Uh. and we had to reevaluate luckily I had a senior a senior guy that arrived on the next arriving ladder and, and we worked together we put it in the correct spot and and kept it to uh, the apartment of origin. Um, but that was an eye-opening experience. Um, learn from the guys that have done it. Learn from training. Try to do it better the next time. Thought you crushed it though, huh? <laughs> I thought we had it. It looked good, our, our cut was nice, and it was done quick. Yeah. Just in the wrong spot. <laughs> hey, hey, little details, you know. That's what happens. All right, so uh, for this one, we're gonna be talking about ventilation. I want you to pretend you're working at ladder five as normal for you and you get dispatched out to a boomer. So you get the initial dispatch. What are your thoughts, you know, going along the way as you're dispatched out, when you get there throughout the call? Walk us through what you're thinking about. Uh, When we get a dispatch, um, the first thing I'm listening for is the address. Um, One of the things about working up here for so many years was an address will tell me a lot about what I'm going to expect when we get there. Um, All from the address, a lot of times know what type of building it is, what apartment complex it is, if we've had fires there before, what the occupancy is. That's the first thing that pops into my head um, as we're racing out to the truck. All right. And then what about if uh, if you're not first on and maybe you get a size up from from the first in engine? Anything change? Like what are you listening for during that size up? How does that paint the picture? Getting yourself ready for that for that scene? 
to me on the ladder, one of the most important things when I'm listening to a size up as we're in route is we have so many great officers, especially around this area, some guys that really do a really good job. I'm listening to their size up because I know they're describing it really well. And when I arrive, what's different than what I heard on the size up? How much has it changed in that few minutes that it's taken us to get there? Okay. Um, that's important for me. Um, it's crucial to listen to those size ups so that I can compare what I see when I get there. Nice. All right. And so when you finally show up again, you're on the ladder. What are you thinking about upon arrival? Upon arrival, I'm hoping that, um, that we have a nice spot to place the ladder. Um, hopefully the pumper kind of pulled forward just a little bit and gave us a little bit of room. Um, I'm thinking placement at that time, not necessarily the perfect placement for what I see, but a placement for what it is now and what it could possibly be. I want to be set up to have multiple options for my tactics. If I arrive and it's a room and contents fire and we do horizontal ventilation, you know, the ladder doesn't have to be placed perfectly in front. But if it escalates and it needs to be, the aerial needs to be set up by my driver for secondary egress, I want to have that option. If it escalates beyond that to something that we fight a defensive fire, I want to be able to use the stick in a, in a defensive operation. So not only what I see, but options after the fact in case it does escalate into something more. Okay, so just being proactive, being prepared for worst case. Sure, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. All right, all right. So you got your placement down, your driver crushes that, and uh, what are you gonna do after that once you're placed in the right spot? So uh, it's gonna start up with my personal size up, my size up of the of the fire. I heard the initial size up. Now I'm gonna do my own in my own head. Um, I'm gonna give the guys a good idea, give them a starting point of what I want them to do. And then I'm gonna do my own personal size up to confirm what my gut is basically telling me, what I think I'm gonna do, and now I'm gonna size it up and confirm that those are the correct tactics. So I'll look at the building. Um, what strategy are we in? Are we an offensive strategy? If we're offensive, that means we're gonna be aggressive with hand lines and searches, which means my ventilation has to be aggressive to support those guys working inside or possibly the victims that might be still in there. Um, so I'm basing my size up um, in relation to what our strategy is. Um, and then I'm gonna jump into doing my 360. So I want to look, my size up starts with me getting off the truck or arriving, and it's gonna continue while I do my 360. I know the pumpers, I preach this a lot for the pumpers and the, anybody entering the building to do a 360, I'm gonna do my own because I wanna know exactly what's going on. And a lot of the information that's gonna make us work safe is gonna be found by doing this 360. Okay, real quick before we get into your 360, I, I've worked with your crew before actually, and they were telling me you kind of have a set expectations of like what your crew's gonna be doing while you're doing the 360. What do you tell your, what do you tell your uh, pipe men to do while this is going on? I tend, I tend to give them, we start with very basic, uh, very basic things. Um, like I said, the gut feeling that I get when I get there, if I think it's gonna be something where we do, do vertical ventilation and we might have to get to a roof, I'll send them to throw ladders right away so that we're set and ready. Um, a lot of times the pipeman will have to do that by himself, which we have to practice. Um, and my driver will fire up the chainsaws, gather our tools, put them at the base of the ladder, and, um, and I tell them, meet me at the front of the structure. Okay, so they know that just working with you, that's like a uh, expectation that you just laid out for them of when we get when we show up on a fire, they, they all kind of know that's what you expect out of them. Yes, that's kind of the that's the basic. That's what we start with, and I'll tell them if anything is different, I will tell you. Cool. So all we right. start with that. Awesome. So now you're going through and you do your size up. Um, so I just continue my size up, continue my 360. One of the things I'm looking for is what is the smoke when I get there. I check the smoke conditions on my 360 and what are the conditions when I finish my 360. So it's basically a minute or two to do this. Um, and the significance of that is how much has the smoke changed? If I believe it's a contents fire in a residential house and it hasn't gotten significantly worse, that's a good sign. That tells me that we can, we can do tactics a certain way for that kind of fire. We want our tactics to match what we're dealing with. Um, if it's changing and progressively getting worse, we either have to be more aggressive or understand that it's deteriorating quickly and we reevaluate. Um, 
a lot of times what I like to do after I check the smoke on those on the rival size up or 360 and then after is try to make a quick contact with the engine crew make an entry and tell them what I think you know a lot of times we'll say I think it's a room in contents fire in the back bedroom on the left um, I don't think it's in the attic yet we try to do those face to face that way we're on the same page and what we're trying to do some of the other information I guess you're gathering it's probably all subconscious to you now but things like building construction um, any anything specific that you're looking for when you're pulling up whether building construction or occupancy type that you're thinking about yeah so build, building construction is one thing that that I didn't really pay much attention to in my much younger years in this on this job but it's something I came to realize is very very significant for not only the guys operating inside but us if we're thinking about going to a roof or operating under it for that matter um, lightweight construction just fails just so quickly decking will will burn through so much faster than we think so lightweight construction i'm thinking that we have limited time and lightweight construction with the rooming contents fire you know it may be safe to work above but it's something you have to take into consideration because lightweight construction those gusset plates um, the glue that holds this stuff together can sometimes fail with just heat alone so it's something to be very aware of um, in our area, we have a lot of ordinary construction structures, which to me, you know, means we have um, dimensional lumber, which may have a little more time. We have a little more time to deal with. But taking that into consideration, anytime we have fire involvement of any, any roof members or extension into the attic, you want to think long and hard about. Okay, so after you've done your 360, you know, it just... All the stuff you were talking about with building construction, that's only gonna take you a split second to, to look at and, and know for yourself what you're seeing. Um, what else are you thinking about during this size up, like occupancy type, um, rescue profile? How do those different factors affect what you're gonna do? So after, we, so after we do our 360, we look at the construction, the smoke, um, we start looking at the occupancy. Our 360 will tell us whether we believe it's occupied or not, and the conditions that our interior crews are gonna be encountering on the way in. Um, so that's gonna give us some more information deciding what tactic we wanna do. Are we gonna ventilate because we wanna make it tenable for our firefighters to enter um, and to search, for our occupants to be have a more tenable atmosphere so they can survive just a little bit longer for us to find them, or are we ventilating to minimize damage to further parts of the occupancy? You know, for example, a strip mall that we believe is a contents fire but has the potential to get up into the attic and spread to adjoining exposures. Um, do we want to stop it, do vertical ventilation to stop that and make it tenable inside, or is horizontal ventilation uh, going to be appropriate? Um, so we want to take into consideration the occupancy. How aggressive do we want to be? If we believe somebody is inside and it's an untenable atmosphere, we don't have the possibility of doing a transitional attack. A well-placed vertical ventilation um, hole is a good chance to basically flip the lights on inside the structure, clear it out really quickly, hand lines already in place to protect anybody operating inside and um, make conditions much better. Um, we have to, basically everything we do is a risk management. So if we think it's safe to go to the roof and we can cut a hole, and make it safer for everybody inside, firefighters and occupants included, um, then we can do that. If it's what, something, does, uh, what does flip the lights on mean? If anybody has worked on a pumper and been in a fire where they're just, they just can't see where they're going, they, don't, they can't find the fire, they keep running into walls, and somebody puts a hole above the fire and a nice well-placed hole with the smoke and heat, because it all wants to go up and out, and we put a well-placed hole, I call it flipping the lights on. Oh, cool. Because it's basically, at that point, you can stand up, you can see exactly where you are. It's something that I witnessed with some great ladder officers that I worked with when I was on the engine. And now, on, you know, some guys will talk to us and be like, flip the switch on. It's, it's kind of that dramatic. Nice. Um, and so that's why vertical ventilation should continue to be an option as long as we do it safely and for the right reasons. All right, so we talked about some of the factors you're looking at to determine if you're getting into 
horizontal or vertical ventilation. You quickly just touched on the smoke conditions, but you know, again, I'm coming from the rescue, so I've been on way less fires than you. Um, can you describe maybe some of those smoke conditions and what information can, can I get? Like if I see brown smoke or for example, like what am I gonna be able to get out of these different smoke conditions? Sure. So one thing we wanna look at is the volume, velocity, density, color, which we all know. Um, but not only that, but how much it's changed. We need to constantly be evaluating what the smoke has done from our arrival to whenever we're checking it again. Um, always be seeing if it's getting better or worse, if the color is changing. Um, brown smoke, obviously, which we've learned probably from day one in the academy, is that that is uh, untreated wood, which tends to tell us it's uh, support members um, of the structure. Um, that tells us you might want to think twice about possibly going to the roof because it could fail. Um, velocity tells us it could be it could be a contents fire or if it's turbulent, a contents fire that's spreading quickly. Turbulent tells me that something's going to change real quick. It's going to get real wor uh, much worse if we don't do something about it as far as cooling it off, venting it, stuff like that's that. That's just hotter smoke, right? The hotter the smoke, the... Uh the hotter the smoke, velocity. the more the more um, velocity that it has, um, which is uh, which is dangerous. You know, you got to address it pretty quickly. Um, density, thicker smoke, all those particles that are floating around in the smoke, the thicker it is. You have to imagine smoke is basically at any time can ignite, and the thicker it is means the more volatile that ignition um, will be. So dense smoke is, you know, something again that has to be addressed if. If it's dense smoke um, inside the structure and they can't enter and we don't have the ability to do a transitional attack, a vertical ventilation hole and to get that stuff to escape up and out to make it more tenable and safer for those guys so they don't go 10 feet in and get hit with a flashover, you know, it's something to consider. And then of course the color, uh, white can be moisture, it's usually early, early fire stuff, um, moisture is burning off. It could also be smoke that's traveled a distance. Um, How does that work? You're saying if the smoke travels a distance, it'll be white? Like, yeah, so what are the details on that? So smoke will, smoke has little particles in it and the farther it goes, the heavier particles, which are the, the unburned um, stuff from the furniture or the thing that was burning, they tend to drop off. Okay. So as it travels, it turns like a wider, a grayer. Like the a dirty, farther it goes, dirty the, white color. Yeah, um, uh, we talked about the brown smoke, which is could possibly be uh, untreated wood, structural involvement, and the black smoke. And smoke is fuel, um, and you have to appreciate that um, because if you're putting anybody in in that thick black smoke, you have the possibility of putting them in a very uh, difficult situation, dangerous situation. So. You've talked about 360 quite a bit. Have you learned any lessons on the importance of a 360? You said you do your own. Even if even if somebody else has already done one, you said you do your own. So sure. what kind of lessons learned have you gotten over your career, the, the importance of that? The importance of a 360, I can't overstate it, and that's something I guys are probably sick of me telling them, especially guys in the LT and captain certs. I preach that as much as possible. You just gather so much information and the way that I describe it to them is why would you go inside a building without knowing as much as you can before you send your guys in there? Sometimes it, it really works out. Sometimes you get a ton of information and you can meet up with the, the engine crew, make an entry and say, hey, it's back bedroom to the left and they know exactly where to go. Or, hey, this is a pretty significant fire. We can do a transitional attack and make it much safer for all of us. And then you can use that, that information we learn where windows are. We learn if it's an enclosed structure. We learn where the fire is. We learn where exhaust exits can, can be for our horizontal ventilation if that's um, what we decide to do. We can determine what window or door we think we're gonna use for our horizontal ventilation. Uh, we just gather so much information. And um, you know, a 360, we were fortunate enough to do it when we did a 360 to find someone trapped in a bathroom just outside the fire and we were able to coordinate um, a transitional attack with um, me and my crew making entry in very limited visibility, finding him in the bathroom and being able to get him out. 
Um, I don't think he would have lasted much longer. And had we not done a 360, we may never have heard him. Yeah. Um, so I, I just can't stress the importance of it enough. Um, it doesn't always give you a ton of information, but the times that it does is very, very important. Awesome. All right, so we've talked about you know, what you're, what you're seeing on arrival, placement of your ladder, uh, factors that affect the decision you're gonna make. So now let's get into actually making that decision, um, whether it's gonna be horizontal or vertical ventilation, and also maybe we can talk about some of the, the new studies, maybe that, uh, what was that NIOSH study in 2013 where they did all that research on vent limited fires and all that. So sure. I guess starting, we've heard about flow pass. Can we talk about that for a second? Flow pass, one of, the, one of the things that from a ladder perspective that, that I try to think about as much as possible is prior to doing something, understanding what it's gonna do. We want things to get better, not worse. Our job on a ladder or a ventilation is to make things better for either people inside, make it safer for them to operate, whether they've extinguished the fire and they still can't see anything. Um, so we want things to get better and, and you have to really understand if I open this door, what am I introducing? If I open this front door, we all consider now, we all know that uh, the front door is a ventilation opening. We consider that a ventilation opening. If I pop the back door and they haven't reached the seat of the fire yet, or they're not masked up and charged hand line and ready, ready to, to attack the fire, what is gonna happen to this fire? It's gonna wanna go towards the oxygen. If we open the front door and they're not ready yet, um, and they're not aware of it, then we're gonna make this fire much, much worse. Hopefully nobody would be inside during this time. So um, flow pass is just kind of one of those things where the, ox the, the fire is sometimes starved for oxygen and it wants to find oxygen. And if we introduce it, um, it's gonna spread towards that opening. And you can see that in a, a neutral plane, they call it. So the neutral plane is just gonna be the level where the smoke is coming out. And then below that is gonna be the the fresh air rushing in, right? So that's, we kind of talk about that like a bi-directional flow. Um, a neutral plane will tell us, you know, the significance, sometimes how long it's been burning, um, how thick it is, where it is in relation to height off the ground. Um, we can learn a lot from seeing that neutral plane. The bi-directional flow is a vent limited fire. We open the front door, smoke's coming out the top, and oxygen's flowing in. We know that that fire is basically dragging that, dragging that oxygen in the front door. And if we leave the door open without either cooling the atmosphere um, or extinguishing the fire, it's gonna get much worse very quick. If you haven't looked up videos on YouTube about this, uh, you should because it happens very quickly. Um, so we need to think about that when we, we do flow pass. Um, and I'm glad you brought up neutral plane. One of the things that we started doing when I was on the engine was upon arrival, especially if the front door was open, take a quick peek inside and see where the neutral plane is, then shut the door, control the door. And then prior to making entry after we've masked up, chart bled our line, all that stuff, um, has it changed? That's gonna tell us that in that 30 seconds or that minute or however long it takes you to do that stuff, how much has changed? Because rate of change is very, very important for everybody operating on the fire ground. Rapid change of smoke or fire conditions is, is uh, something that needs to be addressed and it's, it's dangerous if we don't address it. Yeah, you mentioned some of those videos and a lot of them you can just see that neutral plane just going lower and lower to the floor and it's almost like that's a pretty telltale sign of the uh, impending flashover. It's like sure. the lower that gets, the, the more, more that thick smoke is built up and that fuel that we've been talking about. That's one thing that I'm glad um, in that particular uh, example, I'm glad that we kind of learned and evolved and, and started doing transitional attacks because we know how significant those are. We used to just get lower and lower and lower. Don't open the nozzle till you reach the seat of the fire and it was dangerous. Now we have the option to do a transitional attack, make it safer for us and then be aggressive um, through back through the front door to the seat of the fire to continue the extinguishment. Um, I'm glad that that's an option. And that transitional evolving. is just gonna cool everything down? Sure. Inside. Cool it down, make it tenable for us to reevaluate 
and rapidly stretch our hand line or take the second line that we have, the backup line, and make that the primary line and finish extinguishment. But it's got to be done quickly. All right, so now time to choose. Are we going to do uh, horizontal ventilation or vertical ventilation? So we we talked about all the different factors, but really what's it going to come down to and then how's that going to look? So if you're going to decide to do horizontal, you know, what, what uh, signs led you to that? and how is that going to look to actually implement it so this was this is a topic that's brought to my attention of guys that want to be on a ladder or or whether it's rescue lieutenants or engine lieutenants that they want to be captains or guys moving from the engines to the ladders this is a topic that is brought to my attention all the time like how do we decide so that's why we kind of wanted to talk about all these different gather as much information as possible um, and I was pretty nervous about this because there is some sort of gut feeling that I get when when we when we show up and we we gather all this information a little bit of a gut feeling that tells you horizontal is the way to go or vertical is the way to go the information we gather either confirms my gut feeling or goes against my gut feeling and we change based on what we found um, you can do horizontal ventilation 100 percent of the time you can do vertical ventilation 100 percent of the time but that doesn't mean that's always going to work so that's why we kind of work on getting this information as much information as possible so we make a make an informed decision um, a lot of times i found very room and contents fires that have the potential to spread rapidly throughout the rest of the house or or strip malls that we have potential to lose a ton of more more property but it hasn't gotten into the void spaces yet um, those to me are vertical ventilation options now we got to look at the information that we find from each individual one but those are chances that we have uh, for vertical ventilation top floor fires in apartments where we can lose i mean everybody probably in this department's been to an apartment fire that started as a room and contents kind of snuck away from us because we thought we had it and if we had placed a ventilation hole um, above the apartment, we could have saved an entire apartment complex. I think we've all been a part of that one. So these, these apartment fires, sometimes we have a room and contents fire um, and there's openings in the, um, in, the, in the ceilings and it could possibly be spreading, um, but we may not see the signs of that early, but a well-placed hole above the fire can almost, almost guarantee that it's not going to spread horizontally. That fire, like I said earlier, it wants to go up and out. The smoke wants to go up and out. Sometimes we just got to give it a place to go. And if we put a well-placed hole, we can minimize any of that mushrooming in the attic space or void space, and we can significantly um, stop the spread of that fire. That's why we have to gather all this information, the building construction, um, if it's, if it's safe to be up there. Yeah, one thing that we haven't talked on yet, like specifically to vertical ventilation. So if that's a decision that's made and now we're gonna do vertical ventilation, you know, I know like tile roofs are a no-no. Um, well, like what about like a metal roof or at what, what slope or pitch do you wanna get a roof ladder up there to make sure that you're safe and what pitch do you feel comfortable without any kind of roof ladder? Um, can we talk about like the actual specifics of getting up there so this is this is kind of where my uh being in this area for so long we have a very limited construction type around here so i don't have a ton of experience with steeped roofs or uh, i'm um, sorry pitched roofs there's no spanish tile over here? there's not much spanish tile in our area um so we don't do tile anymore i get that and there's techniques to make it safer um it's just it takes a little bit longer and it's too long for me. I like to make a cut and come down and then reevaluate how it worked. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience with that. I've only used a uh, roof ladder once. Okay. And that was more as a, of a precaution because it was much, much earlier in my career and we weren't sure if we should be up there. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons that, you know, speaking earlier about learning experience, something why I practiced so hard with building construction and the smoke was we probably shouldn't have been up there. Okay. That's the reason we had the roof ladder you know, we shouldn't have been up there. Um, if we can walk it, to me, it's safe for us to be up there as long as we take all the other things into consideration. 
Um, and that's why um, we talked about it earlier. Get my guys, throw a ladder right away, get the chainsaws ready if I think that that's an option. Because if we do want to go up there, we want to make it really quick, get it done, and get off. One of the things, some of the books I've read, again, like all my knowledge is book knowledge, so I'm glad we're able to have this conversation. But some of the books say, like, you're supposed to ladder the roof, you know, where you know it's going to be stable, and that way you can feel the, the changing conditions. Have you ever done that? Like, you've been up there, and you're, like, sounding the roof, and then all of a sudden you can, you can notice a difference or... Is it pretty easy to tell, like when it's a spongy? Sure. Yeah, you can definitely you can definitely tell um, just the way the tool bounces off the roof. Um, you can tell when you take a step. Um, the, I like to go, you know, being some for the most part at this point in my career, one of the more experienced guys on my truck at any given time. Um, I like to be the first one up on the roof, and to show them exactly where to go. And you tell them, follow me. And there's been times where. You know, my information, my gut feeling was wrong. We get up on a roof. This is not a tenable roof. You know, and we relay that information to command and the other units and we get off and we reevaluate. You're not going to get it right every single time, but you need to recognize when stuff, something's not safe. At that point, if it's not safe, it's not worth the risk of falling into a fire. You know, we have other options. And that's something I want, I want guys on the ladder to know um, is that we have options. If something becomes a to a point where it's not safe to be doing it and the benefit's not worth the risk, reevaluate, go through your steps one more time and come up with a better tactic. Nice, yeah, that's another question actually you just brought to my attention is uh, you're, you're seeing all these different signs deciding you're doing vertical or horizontal. Do you uh, let command know like, hey, we're gonna get on the roof? I mean, I know those are our benchmarks, but it's just, is it more of like telling them or asking them or how's that usually go the radio traffic yeah th this has kind of been up for debate a little bit um everybody should be aware of what everybody else is doing and a lot of times that's done over the radio but as far a face to face with fire tech i try to do is face to face with them as much as possible so i'll tell them hey we're going to the roof to make a hole or we're gonna we're gonna make a cut on the roof um and then once i'm on the roof it'll be radio traffic after that but a lot of times, as far as vertical ventilation versus horizontal ventilation, we won't ask command. They, they, when we get assigned to ventilation group, they're trusting us to go through the steps, gather as much information as possible, and then relay back to them what our tactics, what we chose our tactics to be. And there's some debate right now, what's, what's the right way, what's the wrong way? And I don't know what's right, I don't know what's wrong. Um, but if we train on this stuff, our chief officers, they can trust that we're making informed decisions. And if they see something that's much different, you know, they have every right to say, well, let's like, think twice about going to that roof. Or anybody on the fire ground for that matter has the right to say, hey, you know, think twice about that. Right. Uh, we see this, cool. you know, as long as you have information why we shouldn't be doing it. But for the most part, we're entrusted with gathering this information on our own and, that, and making a proper, proper decision. Um, and I have one time in my career on the ladder, I was told, no, don't go up there, you know? So I took that as he sees something that I don't. We reevaluated, we went to horizontal ventilation, which also worked. And then after the fact, we had a nice conversation about what did you see? Here's what I saw. And then next time we do it, we're on the same page. So we all see different things on the fire ground. We're all looking out for each other. I don't think anybody doesn't want somebody to do something that's not do vertical ventilation. They just want them to be safe. Yeah. So if we're gathering this information and we're doing um, these tactics safely, then I think that's uh, what we all want. And then is in for horizontal ventilation, like what's that actually look like? Is it you're going inside you know, talking to fire tech inside face to face with them. Are you like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to bust out this window and start up the fan. Like, how's that conversation work? There, there's two ways that we do horizontal ventilation. Um, as far as us here at, at, at fives, um, we will make a face to face and talk to fire tech, like I said before and say, Hey, I think it's in the back bedroom, you know, over here. 
And sometimes he'll give me the information like, hey, I think it's in this over here. It's a kitchen fire or something like that. And we kind of we kind of do a little bit face to face. Um, if it's something that we have to go through the structure to get to that window to pop out, you know, we might not do that. We may go around through the back, have someone. We usually leave our driver at the front door with the fan, say, hey, get the fan ready. Don't fire it up till you get the uh, get the OK. And then we'll go around to the back, you know, vent group to fire attack. Have you reached the seat of the fire? Yeah, we've darkened the fire down or um, fires under control or or you know whatever fire attack says to us say okay we're not going to make it worse by opening this window but we're in a perfect position to do it we take the window out and then we fire up the fan you know at that point usually we go we go inside and and make a face-to-face -face with fire attack is it working nice um, so yeah we always hear you know coordinate with fire attack and sure <laughs> what that actually looks like right unseen, i think seen but i, I think know, a lot of people aren't 100% sure what that really means. And it just means we just need to be on the same page. We, we wanna be communicating regularly with each other. Um, so there's no surprises. You know, if we do something and it gets worse, well then we need to, everybody needs to know. Yeah. You know, if we're gonna cut a hole above these guys, they need to know. If we're gonna fire up a fan and they're not ready, you know, they need to be ready. Right, again, with all those, the vent limited fires and as soon as you do that, if they're not ready for it, it could get a lot worse sure. inside. We could turn it into a blowtorch, and we could really we could really hurt some people. Um, so that that's what what it means to kind of coordinate with fire attack. When I know everybody hears that over the radio, basically it just means make sure you're on the same page. Let them know before you do something that could potentially change flow pass or fire conditions, so that they're either prepared for it or they have the option to tell you, you know, stand by. And which has also happened. Fire attack to vent group, standby, fire's knocked down, we're doing hydraulic ventilation right now. You know, those kind of things. So after we coordinate with fire attack, we kind of decide, um, we let them know if we're doing horizontal, vertical um, ventilation, uh, we, we get it fired up and we get off the roof or get to the front door and we basically at this point, we make entry to go make face-to-face -face contact with fire attack um, let command know, of course, that we're entering the structure at this point. Um, we go in, make contact with fire attack. Um, they're going to tell us, oh, man, the light switch went on or it's gotten much better or it's not, you know, like we still can't really see what's going on. And we can work with them to kind of modify our tactics to make it a little bit better. Um, just because we fired up a fan doesn't mean we're done. You know, at that point, maybe... Maybe we shut bedroom doors, they shut bedroom doors and we need to ventilate different rooms, um, help them look for hot spots. We'll start helping them overhaul. Um, and that way, with us being face to face with them, if we do have hot spots and we need to kill the fan for a few seconds um, so that we can, we can uh, reevaluate or overhaul, we can fire it right back up. Um, when we need to, if it makes flares, flare stuff up because so much oxygen is being introduced into the structure, we can shut it off. Um, but we can do that all face to face, which minimizes uh, radio communications, with, which I think everybody can appreciate. Um, and we always have pike poles with us. That's kind of one of our mandatory tools so we can make entry, make face to face, determine if our ventilation worked, and then we're in a position to help them overhaul some of the higher ceilings. So they're not using their halogens to reach above their head yeah. and hurt themselves, stuff nice. like that. Um, so that's kind of where we go after we do ventilation. Um, and then once the fire and overhaul is done, you know, we start thinking about secondary searches, which command will probably start assigning somebody to do so we can clear out room by room by closing and opening doors, shutting back doors and doing room by room. So the secondary search can really do a good job of, of checking those rooms. Nice. All right. So I want to take this the opposite direction and say this fire was not controlled. And now again, on the ladder, you said you talked about the placement earlier, how you're always preparing for the worst. Well, what if that worst case scenario happens and it's got to be uh, defensive operations? Uh, is there any, any useful little tricks or tips you can give us as so hopefully we took hopefully we took just an extra couple seconds to think about the possibilities of what may happen uh, when we arrive on scene. 
like I said, not what we see, not what's happening right now, but what it has the potential to be. Um, and we've placed it in a decent position. We're not parked next to cars where we can't put the outriggers out. Um, hopefully we'll have access to the entire structure or at least two corner, two sides of the structure with our aerial. Um, if it's larger than that, we probably have another ladder coming anyway. Um, so we want to think of what it could possibly do. You know, at that point, a lot of times with, with my guys, you know, if I don't, if I don't think we're going to be using the aerial to start, you know, my driver will bunker up and he'll be extra hands for us to work together. Um, if I do think it has the potential to go the defensive route, we'll have him set it up while me and the firefighter are doing um, some other stuff. Um, so hopefully we're trying, we're, we're prepared for that um, a little bit earlier. Um, we go to defensive fires and we're protecting exposures and we're, we're monitoring the safety of our crews, things like that. So it's not a huge rush, but at the same time, nobody wants to stand out there taking 30 minutes to set up the ladder or playing catch up, even if it is a defensive fire. We want to be set up and ready to go um, in case it does. We do have exposures, um, things like that. Um, so hopefully we were set up in a decent spot, either at the front of the structure, maybe around a corner where we had access to two different sides. Um, and close to the, f the forward pumper where we can, they can easily hook up to us and, and we do our tactics that way. And are you able to see just, you know, if you're just up there with the driver, are you able to see if the stream is effective or um, do you have to actually climb up there ever? So sometimes, sometimes with the, when we go defensive like that, you can't see the top of the structure. Um, a lot of times we'll send a firefighter up there. Um, they want to see that anyway, for the most part. They want to get up there and see if we're having progress. And um, we'll communicate face-to-face -face or through our mic system that we have on the aerials. Um, and he'll let me know or he'll put the, put the master stream in the appropriate place. And then maybe after a few minutes, he'll come down. Um, if we place our ladder in a good spot, we're going to have a good view of most structures that we're going to go to. Um, and then also, like I said, if it's a bigger building and we have, you know, Ladder 13, who has a bucket and they're set up on the opposite corner, um, we'll communicate with them. Hey, your master stream, had your, put your master stream a little more to the east or this or that. Um, so there's some, some radio communications and sometimes face-to-face -to, -face, um, to make sure it's put in the proper place. And we'll send a firefighter up to the tip of the ladder to, to reevaluate occasionally. Um, but most of our drivers are pretty, pretty good at, at working on, um, on placement of those master streams. One of the things we like to work, work on here is um, actually practicing flowing water because the nozzles, if you haven't messed around with the nozzle on an aerial, it's not up, down, left, right. It's all on a swivel, so you got to practice that stuff. Um, but, you know, it takes practice and training, and that's, that's what makes us good at our job. Awesome. You got any closing thoughts you want everybody to know before we wrap this up? Uh, just this information, this is just kind of stuff that I've, I've kind of gathered over the years, um, done some things right and done some things wrong. Um, my biggest advice to anybody that's interested in, in getting to a ladder, uh, I went from an engine to a ladder after 13 years, pretty much 13 years here on engine five, I went to, uh, thought I'd make a pretty seamless transition to the ladder. And I quickly realized that there's a lot more to it than firing up a fan at the front door and cutting a hole in the roof. Um, so if anybody's interested in doing that, I recommend to them that they really go about on their own, getting some training, watching some videos, reading some material um, about different tactics, building construction, gather as much information as possible um, to make you more efficient at your job and be safer at your job. That way these decisions whether to do vertical or horizontal, you're doing it much, much safer and you're making things better for everybody else. Um, I also recommend talking to people that have been doing it for a little bit and pick their brains and ask them like, how do I get started? How, how do I prep myself for this? Don't think of a ladder as I'm gonna run 70% less calls and maybe fight a couple fires. Think about the importance of what we can do. We can do some really good things or we can run 70% less calls. So take, awesome. take it serious and, and try, to, try to be the best uh, ladder officer you can and use the experience of other people uh, to be as good at, as good at it as possible. Awesome. 
All right. Well, Captain Joe Lopez, thank you very much for coming on. I know a lot of people are a little bit uh, apprehensive about getting on here and you know sharing their opinion, but we appreciate you and thanks everybody for listening. We'll talk to you on the next episode of the AFR podcast. Thank you.